Hey everybody, welcome back to our continuing discussion of neural communication. This time we're talking about receptors. So we're talking about receptors mostly for neurotransmitters here. So what receptors do is they basically detect the presence of a signal. Neurotransmitters bind to a receptor and then separate. It's worth noting, this may sound obvious, that the receptors do not bring the neurotransmitter into the cell. Um, I see this is a mistake people make a lot of the time. They think that the neurotransmitter shows up and then goes through the channel and does things inside the cell. It's not uh, the case. Um, it binds and separates. Uh, receptors can have multiple subtypes. They can have different or even opposite effects. And we can engineer drugs to target specific subtypes for greater specificity. So to use an example that we'll talk about in much greater detail later on, uh, dopamine has five receptor subtypes, uh, D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5 which are further subdivided into two kind of families. There's D1-like, which is D1 and D5, which are excitatory in terms of their effect on certain intracellular signaling molecules, and D2-like, which are D2, D3, and D4, which are inhibitory with regard to the same signaling system. So different receptor subtypes can function very differently. Uh, they can have different or even opposite effects, as is the case with um, the dopamine receptor types. Uh, they can be entirely different types of receptors. You can have, like with GABA, for example, uh, one type being ionotropic and one type being metabotropic. So the only thing that's necessarily in common with receptors is that they are activated by the same neurotransmitter, right? So glutamate receptors are activated by, by glutamate, GABA receptors are activated by GABA, etc. So let's talk about some receptor types. Uh, first off, we have ionotropic. Ionotropic receptors are comprised of four or five subunits with an ion channel in the middle. So here we see the receptor subunits, these bits that are making up the actual shape of the um, receptor. And you can see in the middle a pore is formed. The ion channel, uh, when the shape of this changes, can be opened to allow ions to flow through. So basically, yeah, these subunits are just smaller proteins that are seated together that comprise the uh, receptor. Binding at the binding site will cause a conformational change. So the shape of the receptor will change. And with the ionotropic receptor, it's going to cause the ion channel to be open, allowing the passive transport of ions. Right? Remember how we talked about concentration gradient and electrostatic pressure? Those are forces that promote passive transport. No energy is necessary, right? The ions will move essentially on their own according to those forces. So all that happens with ion channels, ionotropic receptors, is that when the neurotransmitter binds, it causes a change in the shape of this mass of proteins, which will allow ions to flow through. And if the ions can flow through, they will. Desensitization of ionotropic receptors can happen. Uh, there are various circumstances that can cause this. We'll talk about them more later on in more specific examples. But uh, when desensitization occurs, the channel will remain closed even when ligands are bound. So down here is just another little illustration of that. We have in green our neurotransmitters, in red we have our ions, and in purple we have our protein subunits that make up our receptor. When the neurotransmitter is bound, you can see that there's a change in the shape of this configuration and a pore opens up, allowing neurotransmitters to flow through. So we also have metabotropic receptors, which look a little bit different. Uh, these tend to act more slowly, uh, so with an ionotropic receptor, it's a very fast, transient response, right? Channel opens, channel closes, ions flow in, it happens very quickly. With metabotropic receptors, things happen a little bit more slowly, but the effects tend to be a little bit more long-lasting. Unlike ionotropic receptors, which are made up of all these different little subunits, with a metabotropic receptor, we have a single subunit with seven transmembrane domains. So what does that mean? Basically, it just means that it sort of snakes its way through the membrane seven times, creating these seven different transmembrane through the membrane domains. So instead of opening an ion channel on the site of this receptor, with metabotropic receptors, typically we see action occurring via G proteins. Uh, so we can call these G protein coupled receptors or GPCRs for short. So let's talk more about G proteins. Okay, so in short, G-protein coupled receptors can inhibit or activate ion channels elsewhere, right? So our metabotropic receptor, our GPCR here, doesn't have ion channels contained within it, but it can affect ion channels elsewhere. 
Some ion channels are gated not by ligands or not by voltage, but they're gated by the presence of a G protein. So this channel right here is an ion channel that can be opened by G protein mediated signaling. An example of this might be, you know, the opening of potassium channel, channels, which would hyperpolarize a cell. Another thing that GPCRs can do is stimulate or inhibit effector enzymes in cell membranes that synthesize or break down second messenger molecules. So we see here, we have the stimulation of our GPCR, which is going to activate this G protein, which is going to stimulate this effector enzyme. This is just an enzyme that's going to help um, synthesize second messengers. And we'll talk next time all about what second messengers are and what they do. So an example of this would be something I mentioned offhand earlier, would be stimulation of a dopamine D1 type receptor, increasing the levels of cyclic AMP, uh, a molecule, a signaling molecule that's downstream of that receptor. So to sum up what's happening on this slide, GPCRs don't contain ion channels, but they can inhibit or activate ion channels, which will have a very sort of similar effect to what we saw elsewhere, or they can do something much more complicated, which is starting a big intracellular cascade of events. And what this does depends a lot, like I've said before, on what system we're talking about. This is going to cause a cascade of events that's going to cause relatively long-lasting changes within the cell that could do any number of things. And we'll talk about more specifics uh, later on. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is allosteric binding. This is something we've sort of touched on previously, but I'm going to talk about it in more depth. Okay, allosteric binding, I've also referred to this as uh, non-competitive or indirect uh, binding, happens at non-principal allosteric sites. So this can happen on both ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. Uh, it's basically just binding anywhere that's not the principal site. So if we have a GABA receptor, for example, if something can bind and produce some kind of effect at a site other than the GABA site, then we would call that allosteric binding or binding at an allosteric site. So an allosteric modulator is a molecule that can bind to an allosteric site and alter the functioning of that receptor. This can be positive or negative, right? In the example I gave earlier, if your direct agonists work like a key that can open the door, uh, an allosteric modulator is going to be something that like keeps the door open longer. The thing I couldn't think of the name of, the, um, the mechanism that makes a door close more slowly so it doesn't slam. Your allosteric modulator is going to be something like that. It's going to keep the door open longer, right? And the example we gave to illustrate that was benzo class drugs, which work as positive allosteric modulators of GABA receptors, right? They keep the chloride channel open longer, allowing more chloride to come through. That's a positive allosteric modulator. There can also be negative allosteric modulators that decrease the efficacy of a receptor, right? If the principal ligand binds and a uh, negative allosteric modulator is also present, it's going to decrease the efficacy of that receptor. It's certainly worth mentioning that these produce no effect alone, right? So an allosteric modulator binding in the absence of a direct agonist or the endogenous ligand is going to do nothing, right? It will not activate the receptor on its own. It's just a modulator. It's going to change the way that that receptor works in the presence of the principal binding site being occupied. These often have greater subtype selectivity than direct agonists or antagonists, so they tend to be a little bit more targetable. Okay, so we can talk through all of that graphically here. So here's our receptor. Uh, it's all very abstracted, right? We have some kind of metabotropic receptor doing some kind of signaling. If we have an agonist alone that binds to the agonist binding site, we're going to see, unsurprisingly, normal signaling. However, if we have an agonist and a positive allosteric modulator is present, we see increased signaling, right? The positive allosteric modulator increases uh, the efficacy of that um, allosteric or of that receptor, right? The agonist alone is the agonist is producing a more powerful effect because the positive allosteric modulator is there. Now, conversely, here we have an agonist plus a negative allosteric modulator. This negative allosteric modulator is going to sort of tone down the efficacy of this receptor. So, when this agonist binds, it's going to produce some signaling, but decreased in some way relative to its normal strength. Finally, here we have an allosteric modulator alone. There's nothing occupying the principal binding site, and as a result, we have no signaling. The positive allosteric modulator does nothing on its own. It needs something to activate the principal site, or else it does nothing. 